Right, well, uh, welcome back, everyone, to this, which is the last session of the day. Um, I hope you're all feeling inspired and not too overwhelmed by information. Uh, before we begin, just a quick note of admin. Um, please fill out your feedback forms, which are in your packs, so that they're really hand in with your badges as you leave the theatre at the end of the panel discussion. This panel is entitled Key Advice for Applicants. Deciding which advice to listen to and which to ignore can be one of the hardest things to determine. But I can assure you, with our panel of seasoned recruiters and careers advisors, all of the advice you're about to hear will fall into the former category. Again, we welcome questions from the audience and we'll be roving with our mics uh, at a couple of points during the discussion. The panel chair is Josh Richman, who is the assistant editor of Law Careers Net and the Training Contract and Pupillage Handbook. Josh has several years' experience in the legal graduate sector, having talked to hundreds of lawyers, recruiters, and students over the years. Uh, so, Josh, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Isla. Uh, the purpose of this afternoon's panel is to illuminate and give advice on the key stages of applying for a training contract. So that's the application forms themselves for VAC schemes and the training contracts themselves. Uh, how to best perform on work experience and how to perform in the interview with recruiters and partners. Uh, I'd ask you to keep your questions for the allotted time in the middle and at the end um, and try to keep your questions uh, unspecific to the firms. Uh, and, you know, these suites are supposed to be for the refreshment of our panel, but we will throw them at you <laughs> if you, like, contravene my rules. <laughs> we won't. You will. <laughs> I will. We'll give you the sweets to throw. <laughs> so just a quick audience poll then, show of hands how many of you have actually applied for a vacation scheme or training contract? And how many of you have uh, done a vacation scheme so far? All right. Lots of advice to be given then, eh? <laughs> um, I'm going to hand over to the panel now to introduce themselves. They're really experienced in this field, so I urge you to listen to their advice. Thank you, Josh. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Caroline Walsh. I'm the Head of Legal Trainee Development and Recruitment at Clyde & Co. Um, I've been with the firm 19 years and two days, having had my anniversary this week. Um, I originally joined the firm um, pre-merger. You may be familiar in 2011, Clyde & Co merged with a firm called Barlow, Lydon Gilbert. Um, I actually came over with the merger. But from my BLG days, I actually set up the graduate recruitment function all those years ago, back in 1995. Um, makes me feel very old, um, but also makes me feel very proud. Some of my then trainees are now partners, and I've made personal friends through those journeys as well. Um, when I came over with the merger in 2011, my role has changed considerably. I now have a much more <coughs> bigger role. We take on uh, more trainees where the two um, firms got bolted on together. So we went from two medium-sized firms to a big firm. Um, and I have an, a, a lot more of an international role as well. So I look after our international secondment program and also trainees we have across the globe. Thank you. Follow that. Yeah. <laughs> Try. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Sarah Warns, I'm the uh, Trainee Recruitment Manager at Edwards Wildman and I also perform the learning and development function for our London office um, as well. Um, I, not 19 years I'm afraid, but eight years um, too with young. Too young. <laughs> eight years with Edwards Wildman and in its various guises we've been through a number of different mergers over the eight years that I've been at the firm, um, so I've seen a fair number of sort of changes. Um, this was the first law firm I'd ever worked for, so I kind of came at it um, with a somewhat stereotypical, maybe wrongly stereotypical idea about what working in a law firm would be all about, and I'm happy to say that it was um, very different to that and actually a pleasant surprise um, uh, to find, and, and as Caroline said, kind of make some good friends along those eight years. Unfortunately, I haven't been in the role long enough to have my first trainee make their way all the way up to partnership but I'm hoping mm. to stay the course. Weddings is another good thing as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I look forward to the questions that we're going to get. Thank you very much. My name's Anna Williams and I'm an employability consultant at the University of Law. I've been there since September. Before that I was at another law school here in London. Um, being a law school careers advisor is my third career my second career was in legal publishing. Indeed, I used to work at Law Careers Net with Josh and his other colleagues. 
Um, I also worked at Chambers and Partners where I was the editor of the Chambers Student Guide for about 11 years. My first career was as a solicitor and I was at a London law firm called Lewis Silkin for about eight and a half years. Um, I suppose my role now is mainly giving one-on-one -on -one advice to students to help them prepare for submitting applications, selecting law firms, and preparing them for interviews and assessment days. Okay, finally, um, I'm Caroline Lintner. I'm the Trainee Recruitment Manager at Norton Rose Fulbright. I joined the firm uh, nearly two years ago, um, so I've had a, a role where I've been looking after the trainees and recruiting them, and now I, I, I focus predominantly just on the marketing, selection and recruitment of our trainee solicitors. Um, this is my 14th year of graduate recruitment. I've worked at Linklater's, what is now Hogan Lovells, they were Lovells when I was there, and Alan and Overy for five years as well. So I've, uh, I've seen a number of different international law firms and um, hopefully we'll be able to provide some advice to you all today. It's one battle-hardened panel. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is online application forms for vacation schemes and training contracts. Uh, so why do firms use them? Why do they ask? What they do? What's the general purpose? And what answers are they looking for? Caroline, would you like to have a go at that? Yeah, sure. I, mean, I think the reasons why we have an application form, I think most law firms these days expect you to put an application form in. There are still some who will accept CVs and covering letters. But from my perspective... Um, they help us to test a number of different skills and, and qualities of a candidate. Um, one of the most important things is your communication skills, how you actually write about yourself. Spelling and grammar is incredibly important in the legal sector um, for obvious reasons, as is attention to detail. So the questions we ask you, they may look quite straightforward, but there are often several different parts to them. And we're testing how well you analyse those questions and how well you think about why is that important to that particular firm and also, overall, why is that important to what we are testing for if you're going to be an, a successful solicitor in, uh, in future years? So we're really looking at um, your ability to analyse and, and, and link the two together. Um, critically, though, I think more so than you can achieve on a CV, you really get to talk about yourself more on an application form. So you can talk about times when you have worked in teams or worked under pressure or dealt with challenging situations. So we, from my perspective from our candidates that apply to us, I get a better sense of your personality, what you're like, what you're like as an individual, what your values are, um, and it really helps us to, to build up a picture of a candidate in a way that I personally think maybe a CV doesn't allow us to. Um, it is also a way of us, you know, looking at um, which candidates should get the interview places, um, and obviously if you have made silly errors on your application form, and we, we, we get people applying to us saying Norton Rose Fulbright with two L's. I mean, that's, that is an automatic rejection. Um, it's attention to detail, and it's really important that you get the basics right. And every year, candidates, sadly, who are very, um, very successful in other ways do let themselves down, um, usually because they rely on spell check a bit too much and don't pick up a dictionary or read it properly themselves. So uh, there are some other bits and pieces you need to be aware of, but that's, from my perspective, that's why application forms are very helpful. Okay. Sarah, how about um, using non-law experiences on your application forms? To what extent should you do that and how should you present them? Um, I think that's incredibly important. I mean, often at uh, events, you know, sometimes events such as this or, you know, law fairs, um, students will come up and say, you know, I don't really have any relevant experience. And then you sort of talk to them a little bit about, you know, what their kind of work experience is. And you just have to try and make them see that all of their experiences will be relevant. It's kind of how you sell them to us and how you make them relevant. Um, you know, I love seeing kind of crummy student jobs on application forms because it gives you a sense that the person has realised that they have a responsibility to kind of earn their own money. There's a sense of responsibility that you, you, you get with that. Um, and, and the sort of stickability thing about kind of doing stuff that isn't necessarily particularly glamorous or exciting, but, you know, there's a bigger picture at stake, i.e. that, you, you know, you want to earn a little bit of your own way. And, you know, it, it's that commitment to kind of sticking at something that, you know, uh, you can see the bigger picture on, but that isn't immediately kind of gratifying. But it's about standing back from those experiences and just thinking, OK, well... Um, you know, I worked in, say, you know, B&Q or something over a summer period, or I do a part-time job in a bar or whatever, 
And it's about kind of thinking about that experience and thinking, well, what of that can I use or might I use in my future career as a lawyer? So you know, working in a bar, for example, um, you know, speed of service, um, you know, perhaps dealing with some tricky situations, um, uh, you know, needing to think on the spot very often, um, developing, you know, relationships with, with, with your customers, you know, um, you know, being a good barman is, is sometimes actually quite difficult, you know, that, that suite of kind of personal skills that are going to be important to you when you're, for example, in networking situations in the future. So it's about standing back from that experience, not seeing it as a label of, you know, working in B&Q or a barman. It's about what did I actually do? What are the scenarios that I dealt with? What do those things demonstrate about me? And then writing about that in that way on an application form. And actually, that's, that's a very valuable thing for us to see. And what do we think makes an application stand out in either a good or a bad way? Anna, I know that you're a stickler for <laughs> presentation particularly. Yeah, I suppose this comes from having been a lawyer, but also having been an ed editor. Um, I've read an awful lot of words in my career, and um, it's a delight when you see an application and it is beautifully written, it's accurate in all respects, um, and I think those are probably in the minority, aren't they? Um, I have numerous one-on-one -on -one appointments with students, and even those with English degrees or even first-class degrees in other subjects, most of them still can't produce a perfect application draft. Um, and if you think about what a lawyer is doing, in addition to drafting legal documents, you're going to be corresponding with clients, with other professionals on a daily basis. And the law firm that's looking at your application form has got this in mind. They will not want their firm's reputation resting on your inability to use the apostrophe. Um, I think it was um, Tech Boss. There's an anecdote I love to tell. There's a Tech Boss somewhere. And he said, even the most techie people that I hire, if they can't punctuate properly, I will not hire them. Because if they cannot show me that they've taken the time to learn basic punctuation rules, how can I trust the fact that they're going to learn what's necessary to perform their job? So with everybody in the room, there's probably a tiny, tiny majority of you that are able to and are probably currently producing flawless applications. But for everybody else, I would do some self-study in grammar, punctuation, don't rely on spell check, take particular care with um, words that can be used either as a noun or as a verb, so practice, for example, or advise and advice. Um, the number of times I've seen the word I led a team, which in the past tense is L-E-D and not L-E-A-D because that's the, um, what would we call it, the, the metal. Um, people using lowercase i's when they're referring to themselves. Um, it's, it's a disaster, an absolute disaster. And all you need is two or three of those in an otherwise well-crafted application, and you're on the no pile. What a waste of your time. So I would definitely, definitely encourage people to undertake some self-study and develop your proofreading skills. Proofreading is an art that develops over one's career. I'm far better at it now than I was when I was at your stage. Um, but I would start just by reading the newspaper with a proofreader's eye. You Believe me, you will spot so many mistakes in the Evening Standard and the Metro, even the Guardian. Um, so definitely throw some focus on your writing style and your um, understanding of the rules of punctuation and grammar, for sure. And uh, there are obviously some horror stories that you must have all had in uh, your years of recruitment. I know, Sarah, you've got a particularly awful one. Um, yes. Um, so when you get to the point on an application form when you're asked to kind of what we call the kind of qualitative questions where you really are getting, oppor getting an opportunity to tell us about something that is significant to you that has demonstrated a key skill or you know, competency that we are, you know, looking for. So you, you, you know, you have a choice to use whatever, you know, whatever is in with your arsenal of experience, your, you know, to demonstrate that thing. And we have a question um, that we were asking somebody to tell us about an example or tell us about a time that they demonstrate or use their initiative. And um, 
this particular person proceeded to tell a very elaborate story about... Um, <coughs> came from a, um, a, a small um, a coastal place, and one summer some porpoises washed up on the beach and proceeded to tell us about how the community came together to rally round to try and keep these poor animals alive people dampening down tea towels and laying them on these poor creatures and trying to sort of keep them wet and, and cool and whatever. Um, all the time, lots of elaborate detail, not really at any point telling me what they particularly did, um, but a very elaborate story that was actually quite amusing as a recruiter to read. Um, the upshot of the story was that they failed to keep these creatures alive and then the applicant proceeded to tell me about a large barbecue that the community then had. And I joke not, um, it sounds very far-fetched, and I'm still not 100% certain about whether this person was putting in a joke application or not, but suffice to say, irrespective of the elaborate nature and the un really poor judgment displayed on the type of example used, the applicant did not tell me at any point what they actually did in that scenario. So that's why that that person was, was, was sifted out. So not only was the uh, judgment displayed on the type of example used, not very good, but uh, the actual content of the answer didn't really tell us about the role that they played in all of this. Why would you say that? <laughs> uh, I touched... copied and pasted it and kept it as a, as, a, as a document in my little kind of bank because it was just such an unbelievable story. Mm. <laughs> Uh, we've mentioned how non-legal work experiences can definitely be used in your application forms, but, I mean, Caroline, how important is it to complete specifically legal work experience and, you know, particularly a vacation scheme if you're going to get a training contract at your firm? Um, I think to have some form of legal work experience is important because you're presenting yourself in an application form saying, I know I want to be a lawyer. And you're probably halfway there if you're doing some form of degree, a law degree, or you've had some previous work experience. Because then you can, you're, it's about evidence, isn't it? You're evidencing, this is, no why, this is why I know I want to be a lawyer. I think the beauty of doing a vacation scheme in particular is the fact that it's two-way, and it genuinely is a two-way process. And I know the panel this morning alluded to that, and that, that you know, these were a group of partners who were telling you as well, it's very much a two-way process. It gives you the opportunity to be in a live working environment. It gives you the opportunity to see us when we talk about culture. Only you can decide whether it's the right cultural environment for you because every firm will be very different. We'll all look the same on the outside, but it's actually when you get in the door and over the threshold, then that's when the differences will appear. Um, and it's got to be about fit. So fit for you as well as fit for us. And that's the beauty of doing the vacation scheme. If you can't get on a vacation scheme, there's plenty of other things that you could, you could do. Um, whatever work experience you can get that maybe has a legal theme to it will be really, really relevant because, again, it's, it's about evidence. You're backing up the fact that this is why I want to be a lawyer, this is why I want to work in a legal environment, because I've had some experience and this is where I felt my skills and everything was transferable and why I think I would be a good lawyer for, for your organisation. Also, don't just get totally hung up on legal work experience. Um, advice that I give to, to students, and I'm beginning to you now, is go and work for a typical client of the, the firms that you're, you're interested in. So you get that real commercial side, you get the, the experience from the other side of the table. But I think what we probably would all agree with is we want to see you utilising your time well and directing your, your summers, if you like, and, and, and your, your kind of free time, not that you probably have an awful lot of it, but in terms of this is what I'm doing to help me on my pathway now to this career. And again, going back, can't say it enough, about evidencing this is my, you know, it's not just a vocational degree, so I'm here going along with the throng because the career service has said this is the time you apply. Um, that you're actually being feeling brave enough to get off that treadmill and say, I'm taking ownership of this, and I know I want to do it, and this is what what I'm going to do. So taking a very measured, thoughtful approach. And if you can really kind of intersperse that with as much experience and, and even coming to today, things like this, where you're in a business environment, you're in a business professional environment, it's giving you an insight to the environment you're ultimately wanting to be in and certainly one that you're going to be in if you go get across the threshold for an interview. I think we can take a couple of questions from the audience now. So if anyone's got anything to ask. Are they that terrifying? They scare me. <laughs> yep. Uh, 
Hi. Um, I was wondering how advantageous is it for an applicant to show a particular interest in an area of law, or does it make them look less receptive to other areas of law and other seats that may, they may take? Um, I think it's good to show that you have an interest in a particular practice area that the firm you're applying to is, is an expert at. Um, if you're putting that on an application form, be, be aware. <laughs> you might have a corporate partner sitting in front of you who gets very excited at interview, saying, well, tell me everything. You, you, you talked about this in your form. Tell me more about it. So a cautionary tale is to only ever put on your application form what you're happy to go beyond what you've written about on your application form. Um, I, I think that's, that's what I would say. It's good to show that you've got a particular interest. We, we have industry sectors that we focus on at Norton Rose Fulbright, and we certainly expect students to pick that up when they apply to us. Um, the other thing, though, is that when you are entering into a training contract or even a vacation scheme, you need to have an open mind about where your career is going to take you. And I was, before I came here today, I was talking to our vacation students who started with us this week, and I was saying just that. It's all very well sort of going into your training contract thinking, I want to do this, this, and this. That's not the way that business works. There's lots of choice out there. There's lots of guidance and support from the likes of us as individuals and our colleagues and HR functions at the firms we work at, who will guide you through your training contract. And it's, it's probably too early to say as to what type of lawyer you think you're going to end up being, because it's quite a, far, a long way down the line. But good to have, a, you know, obviously, an interest. If you know you're going to have to do a corporate seat in a particular firm, you should start reading around that. Look at what the structure of the training contract is. Um, because if you're certainly just hanging all your hopes on going into a very small part of the firm, that might not be the best um, uh, route to go down because you may not, there might not be that many jobs and qualification in a very tiny part of that firm. So if you are interested in a particularly niche part of law, there are some very, very good firms out there that focus specifically on that. If you're open to general, um, you know, a general experience, I think that's certainly, I think we probably all agree with that. It's better to go in with an open mind. But it's good to show an interest, good to show direction because a lot, you'll be surprised a lot of other candidates don't. And, Certainly, they applied to us saying, I want to work for an international firm. You have 54 offices worldwide. And I'm thinking, well, so what? I've written that in the brochure. I know that. Tell me something else that you found out about the firm that's going to show you in a, in a positive light. Any more questions? Josh, I think I might. I, I understand the point that you're making. Is I, I refer to it as being the bad dinner party guest. You know, you invite people for dinner, you've prepared a lovely meal for them, and they arrive and they say, actually, I want three helpings of the starter, not particularly interested <laughs> in your main course, don't really like the look of dessert. So you've got to be the good dinner party guest and have an appetite for all of the courses and don't, don't appear too narrow. That said, in order for you to target firms to decide which firms you're going to apply to, you're going to have to have some sense as to perhaps the sectors that the yeah. firms are working in and, and why you're attracted to those. Caroline, is it okay to mention that you've been on other vacation schemes or mini pupillages when you're applying? Um, I think it is, but again, it's about putting it into context. So I am personally quite put off by applications that I will get that somebody has been maybe to say seven or eight firms because that's going to spark a perception, and the perception will be one of two things. It'll be that you're very well connected and your network are getting you all these opportunities, um, or you're very good on paper, but you're not actually turning it round and getting the offer at the end of it. So I think it can ring an alarm bell on, on two counts there. But I do think, again, it's about the evidence. You know, I know I like this firm because I have been to other similar firms and what really sparked my interest, and again, you were saying to the lady there saying about having a particular interest in a, in a sector or a practice area, again, you're backing it up. Um, and when it comes to assessment days, how do, what's the best way to shine there? I know these are very daunting to a lot of students. So, Caroline, what's your, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I think you've got to... You've got to be yourself, and it is difficult when you're nervous, but you know, we are looking for people to join our business, and you're joining a partnership, and partners will interview you, and they will be looking for what else you can bring apart from intelligence. They want to know whether they're going to get on with you, whether they can see themselves sharing an office with you, can they put you in front of their best client, and, and be convinced you're not going to completely ruin that relationship in, in two minutes. Um, they're looking to see what you're like as a person because you, know, you do work long hours in the legal sector and you do work in very tight-knit teams, and that's very important to 
to be yourself. Um, you, are, you need to accept the fact you're going to be asked to do a number of exercises that you probably can't prepare for, but you at least will know that you will probably be asked to do um, some form of a team working exercise, a negotiation, a group exercise. More often than not these days, a written exercise. And you're obviously going to have an interview. So you just need to go into it with an open mind. You've got to try and do as much prep as you can do. But we are going to deliberately take you off your application form because we want to see what, what is beyond that, what's beneath what you've told us already. I view the application form as a way of getting the interview. It's also, we're going to test you in different ways to see how you cope under pressure and with information that you haven't seen of, seen before the assessment days because that's what happens on the job. So it's, you just don't, don't rely on just building up a good rapport of your interviewers because increasingly assessment days are across the piece. We want to see how you perform in a variety of different ways. And we do that because we want it to be an objective and fair process. And some people are fantastic at interviews, but we want them to be good in group exercises and be good in written exercises as well. And, and that, that's my view. You've just got to, I'm afraid, just accept that we're going to put you through these processes um, and try and prepare as much as you can do. Do any of the three firms here use psychometric tests on these assessment days? So, yeah. sounds scary. <laughs> um, I mean, what we're trying to do, and I mean, the, we don't like, you know, there's no ceiling mark or anything that you've got to get to. And for us, um, you know, the majority of the assessment that we're doing is based on, you know, the exercise and, um, you know, the group exercise that we do. But actually, sometimes there are some people that may be you kind of see a little bit of in those kind of group exercises, but perhaps you feel that you haven't seen enough to make a balanced kind of judgment. So um, we do those kinds of exercises to just give us another layer of information about a particular, you know, candidate to help us make a decision one way or the other. And, you know, with these types of exercises, it's, it's you know, try and think about you know, all the time we're trying to, throughout this process, selection process, trying to visualise you at the firm, kind of doing the things that lawyers do, being in the situations that lawyers are in. And for us, those types of tests, what they're, what they're doing is kind of putting you in a situation where you've got a limited time period in which to draw some logical conclusions about data that is presented to you in two different formats, a verbal format and a numeric format. Both of those things are, are things that you're going to have to do on a pretty constant basis during your kind of working life. So kind of go into them not with the, the, the view that they are like a test and a hurdle that you've got to get across. View them as a, a, just a way of seeing how your mind works in this type of situation. You know, how does your brain respond to these, these kinds of things? Um, you know, and it's, there's, like I say, there's, there's no kind of you know, ceiling mark generally that you've got to get to. It's just we want to see how you respond um, when you're in these types of situations and they are things that you will need to deal with in, in the future as well. So, Just to add to what Sarah said, don't forget we're looking for potential. You're, no, there's no such thing as the perfect candidate. We want to train you up ourselves. You'll go to law school and you'll do a lot of that as well. So uh, as Sarah said, we're looking to see how you think and adapt your process of, work, of working to the things you're going to need to do as a lawyer. And, and it's just us seeing that potential and um, I guess if you enjoy being challenged, and you're going to be challenged as a lawyer, to, to excel at being challenged on an assessment day is a sign to us that you are a good candidate for us because you're going to be tested and taken out of your comfort zone on a regular basis, albeit with all the support around you to learn and develop as a, a professional. But um, we like people who um, want to learn, have a thirst for knowledge, because as a lawyer, you never stop learning and you're not going to get to the end of your training contract and know it all. Far from it, it's the start of a very long career where you're going to be continually honing your skills and, and your subject matter as well. In a moment, we're going to talk about the final stage of the application, the partner interview. Uh, but before we do, I think we've got time for a question or two, haven't we? So does anyone have any questions about the application form or assessment day part of the process? You, sir? Sorry, sorry Isla. Uh, thank you. Uh, what most turns you off um, applicants at interview slash assessment day stage? What, was the question? what most turns you what most turns you off for an applicant? What's so actually on off? the day? Yeah. Yeah, behaviour wise. Yeah. Um, shall I take that? Um, I would say pay real great attention to your appearance because again it's about presentation and the perceptions that are being 
gained of you over the day are things like, would we put you in front of a client, um, as well as the usual acid test of, would we share a room with you, we not want to kill you. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's all that kind of thing. And I think, again, your behaviour on the day is really, really key. Um, there'll be, as we've already said, there'll be numerous exercises that will show your ability in terms of your leadership skills, but also being a team player as well. So it's, it's respecting the exercises and the activities that you're involved in. So if you are in a team exercise, we're not looking for you to necessarily demonstrate your leadership skills in a subtle way, yes, but not that you're just going to take over the, the whole exercise because then that, that's not fair on, on, on your colleagues. And then, again, the perceptions are created. Well, in a team situation, would you be such a good team player, for example? Um, and, and I think probably... Not, I mean, I'm not going to bore you with too many stories, but um, again, some people kind of find themselves a bit too relaxed on the day. And nerves are a good thing. Nerves are, are adrenaline um, and it's energy. And we want people who are hungry for it and, and really keen to want to do it. And I think for people, sometimes they can come in and be probably a bit over familiar, maybe overconfident, a bit too relaxed. Um, very, be very careful in terms of like, you know, using networks and maybe backdoor routes because, again, it, it just creates very negative perceptions and the ultimate one is you're just not hungry enough for it. That's what, what I would say. I don't know if any of you would... Any I, I think also that? just how you behave with people who aren't interviewing you as well. So, you know, from my perspective, very occasionally over the last few years, I've had receptions staff call up saying, Caroline, you need to know that this candidate came in and was incredibly rude to my team today. And that, that gets fed back to me, and I feed that back to the recruitment partner. And we don't want someone like that in our business. Um, it is a two-way process, obviously, but we want you to treat us with respect because we will treat you with respect. And that's incredibly important. You're joining... You want to be a lawyer. It's a very... Um, it's quite a conservative um, sector, and it's, it's very traditional in that respect as well. And we, we want people who are going to treat us with respect and our clients with respect. So just, just be aware of that. Um, and and um, kind of being gracious, perhaps when things don't go quite according to plan. So, um, you know, we, we will offer candidates kind of one-to-one -one feedback um, on the day before they leave the office if they haven't made it through to our kind of partner interview stage. And we've had very often instances of people who um, have just gone into those meetings and just literally, you've made the wrong decision here, I tell you, you've made the wrong decision. I mean, it's, you know, it kind of underlines why we didn't select you. Um, and also, like, we, we, we have a feedback form on the day, again, when people have used the feedback form to pour their scorn on kind of what's happened and the fact that maybe they haven't kind of got through. And, you know, just try and retain a sense of sort of dignity. It hasn't worked out with us, but that's not to say it won't work out with somebody else. Um, you know, word may get around about you. Sometimes, yes, it's a big industry, but it can also be incredibly small at times. So just be aware that, you know, you know we all know each other. Um, you know, be aware that, uh, you know, there are horror stories that you wouldn't want to be shared around necessarily with people. Not the porpoises. <laughs> the porpoises. Yeah. I think we can take one more question before we'll have to talk about the uh, partner interview stage. So... Yeah. Um, you mentioned about preparing for the assessment day, so the, um, the teamwork exercise and also the written exercise. How would you advise going about doing that? I think with the teamworking exercise, it's really building upon what Caroline said. Um, most of these team exercises are of some form of negotiation. And the way you're going to be successful to reach a conclusion for your client is to reach some consensus. And it's not about actually being incredibly aggressive with each other and showing that you're the one who wants to dominate. That's not how the world of business operates, nine times out of ten anyway. Um, and we want to see that, again, we're testing your team working ability because as a trainee, you will have to operate with people um, who aren't necessarily in your team you're sitting in, um, who might be working in different offices, who are part of a, a client's team. And we want to see that you can get the best out of your colleagues so that you can reach a consensus, which ultimately, for the client, is the best solution within the right time frame, um, costing them the right amount of money they want to play. So it's always a commercial angle to it, but you've just got to be aware of how you want to come across. I mean, the one thing we haven't said explicitly, and we should say it, is the legal sector is a people business. 
And you can't get away from that. You're not going to be able to hide in a, in a library doing research for the whole of your career. It's a people business. So we want to see how you can get the best out of yourself and, and be confident in that. So you need to think about that. The scenario you're going to be given on the day, it will be a commercial-based scenario. A, uh, very rarely will you have much legal content in there because nine times out of ten, I think I'm right in saying this, certainly for us, we, we're testing law and non-law graduates on the same criteria. Um, but we, so reading the newspapers, forming an opinion, keeping up to date with what's going on, um, it, it's likely to be something that, it, that the firm you're applying to has actually done in the past, and you'll be very lucky if you pinpoint the particular deal, but the point is, I mean, for us, for example, you know, we are gonna, it, it, it would be an internationally based scenario because we're an international law firm. Um, so start reading around what the firms have done, start just having general awareness of what's going on in the world, and when you're reading those newspaper stories, start to think, where do the lawyers come in? If you start thinking about those stories in that way, it's going to really help you to think, OK, that means that practice area is involved or that deal, that that particular partner might be involved. So I think that's all you can probably do when it comes to group exercises. Written exercises, you need to watch your spelling and grammar. That's incredibly important. And you need to read the brief carefully. So ours is very clear about the word limit, or not the word limit, how, how many pages you're allowed to, um, to, to actually submit. And we're saying that for a reason, because we don't want you to write a lovely flowery essay. We want you to write, uh, get the basics down, get to the point, because again, as a, a lawyer, you're going to need to do that. Um, so just be aware, link it back to the role and all the conversations you guys are having with lawyers and, and reading all these fantastic publications that put out there. We are very clear, I think, in what we're looking for. I think pe people sometimes think we all sound the same, and to be fair, we probably do sometimes. But I think we're all very clear about what we're actually looking for and why. So try and link it back to that. Think about what do I know already about what lawyers have to do, and just be aware you're going to be tested on those skills. Reading the brief is incredibly important. It goes back to attention to detail. And if you don't read the brief properly, you're probably not going to do very well in the exercise. I would also be say, be very true to yourself. Mm. <clears throat> I know I've said this to a few people I've spoken to earlier. If you really feel you're not ready to put yourself through this yeah. process, do yourself a favour and don't, yes. because you're just going to fail. And as human beings, we don't take rejection very well, and you're going to end up potentially crushed at the end of it. So all the firms, and, and no matter what firm you're going to, are all pretty much going to have very similar assessment centres. So there'll be an element of the team exercises. You'll probably be definitely written exercises. Some will do psychometric tests. And I think there's no point you going into an assessment centre scenario where it's such a, a you know, big thing, your training contract and your potential career now is hanging on this, and it's the first time you've been involved in a negotiation exercise. So I think that's where really you've got to really dip into the resources that are either on at university or through careers advisors, go to skills workshops, do as much practice because it's not going to be rocket science and what is going to be, you're going to be tested against and the raft of competencies that you're going to be measured against on those days and through the vacation schemes as well. So don't go into it blind, but also be true to yourself. Am I ready for it? Get off what I would call, and I know I've said this to a few of you, get off what I call the second year treadmill, where everyone's on that treadmill. So all of a sudden now it's about getting a good second year, it's good getting good second year results and also getting your career sorted out. That's a big ask. And for a lot of people, they're just on that treadmill. And at some point, you've got to get off it and actually take ownership for your, your own career. And I think that all then ties into how you present your application form, how you're researching the firms you're interested in. This is about you, your career, not that you're at a stage that everybody says, you need to be thinking about training contracts right now. Be bold, be yourself. Yeah. Don't just do all the same work experience. Yeah. You've done eight, I agree with you about doing eight vacation schemes. Yeah. I mean, you probably won't be able to tell us anything different from the first scheme that you did to the last scheme that you did. I like it when candidates have mixed it up a bit. Yeah. They've looked critically at what they've learned from each, each experience. I said this to our vacation students this morning, I hope you're documenting everything, every single thing you're doing in the teams at the moment, because when it comes to the training contract um, interview next week, you're going to get asked about it. So critically think about what you're learning about yourself, what you're learning about the law, what you're learning about commercial awareness. And then if you think, well, I haven't got access to that, go and do something different to get it. Mix it up a bit. You will come across as a much more interesting applicant to us. And you'll have to justify why you did different things, because partners love that. They'll want you to justify your decisions. But it'll probably make for a much more interesting interview. We're going to have to move on to the partner interview. Sorry, gang. That's right. Um, but um, Anna, do you want to think back to your partner interview when you were applying for a training contract? Hmm. I was late for it, significantly late, but there was a hurricane, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, 
I think the partner interview can um, scare some people the most, but I'm not sure that it should if you're adequately prepared for it. Let's, let's make an analogy. If, if you all agreed that you were going to run a marathon or swim the channel, um, what you would do is you would, you would have a programme of training, wouldn't you? You would get yourself ready. You wouldn't just blitz all the training two weeks before the swim was about to happen. And I think that um, with regard to commercial awareness, which is something I think the partners are looking for in that interview, um, you need to take the sort of the long, the long road to becoming commercially aware. Um, so start now, I guess, in six months' time or however many months it is and you're looking at the partner interview and you think, why didn't I take that advice from the City Law Live panel and start becoming commercially aware way back in December? So do start now. As to how you might do it, well, um, I think you have to use your media time well. Um, if you don't have any media time at the moment, then make some and you might have to drop something else. Um, I recommend certain things above all others. I, in terms of print I, or, or reading, I very much like The Economist because it takes a, a global perspective on things. It's never written in too complex a way or you know, too impenetrable a way. So I very much like The Economist. Um, I think you can get a student subscription to The Economist. I think so. Um, my top tip, however, doesn't involve much at all. You can do it lying in bed in the morning. Um, I said to one of my students this morning, we had an appointment, I said, uh, what happens when you wake up in the morning? What time do you wake up? She said, 7 a.m. I said, do you listen to anything? She says, yes, I have Radio 1 on. I said, right, switch to Radio 4 from now on. Because the Today programme in the morning, which is from 6 till 9, or is it 9.30? 9. 9. We're all in work by 9.30, of course. Um, it, it really is uh, touching on what I would call the professional water cooler moments of the day. So whatever is blowing through the news, be it relating to politics or business, the economy, um, societal issues, international, domestic, they have the best interviewees, they're dealing with it all in a very intelligent manner. It's not the sort of light, frothy um, treatment that you get on the 24-hour TV news channels, or even I would suggest on most of the TV news channels, perhaps apart from Channel 4 news. Um, so definitely start listening to the Today program in the morning. I also recommend to students that they have a look on um, iPlayer, and um, there's a uh, business journalist called Evan Davis. Some of you may know him as the um, presenter of The Dragon's Den. He uh, has this show called The Bottom Line, and there are many, many, many um, back episodes available on iPlayer. He gets two or three business leaders in the studio at a time, and each of the episodes has a different theme, and the business leaders will talk about that particular topic, and you will learn about how their decision-making develops. That will help you with your commercial awareness because you're effectively understanding how your future clients are going to be thinking and why they decide to do what they do, what their priorities are, what the limitations on them are as business managers. And um, I certainly think that given it's on iPlayer, you know, you can dip into it as and when you want to. I think you can have it just as an audio file or indeed um, visual as well. And then uh, we were talking about question time um, earlier, weren't we? Um, in terms of, this might well help with the assessment day exercises. If you watch question time, you'll see who's a blooming annoying panellist, who cuts other people off, who presents their argument clearly in a well-structured and succinct manner. Um, so you can learn a lot presentation-wise from things like, um, uh, uh, what was the show? Question, question time. time. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yes, Again, yes. Debate, yeah. how people are presenting themselves and sticking by their argument as well. Yeah, but you've got to go at it um, in a sort of long, slow mm. manner rather than just trying to play catch up towards the end. It'll never work. And it's, yes, it's all about understanding themes mm. as much as facts, yeah. probably more so. And if you take that kind of long approach to it, it's, it then generates the kind of 
you know, the, the, the feeling of comfort of when you talk about those types of things, you talk about them in a much more kind of genuine, more comfortable kind of way, and you don't talk about them in a way that just sounds like you've read them in a book and you're just sort of trotting them out um, because you've read, read about it. You kind of talk about them in a way that, that, that demonstrates you understand or you have a level of understanding, and that's the key thing is that sometimes when you sit opposite people in an interview, they will kind of um, give a, a slightly kind of jargony um, a kind of explanation for something where you're not really sure that the person understands what they're talking about. They've heard a few phrases about something that they think might be kind of in the vogue at the moment, and um, they're not necessarily demonstrating that level of understanding. So that kind of long approach will enable you to kind of play around those those concepts, those themes, those things in your head so that you get comfortable with thinking about them. You get, as Caroline said, get comfortable about being critical about those types of things and understanding how you might go about um, talking about them in your own voice. And that's a very important thing as well, is developing your own kind of authentic mm -hmm. voice and kind of story about those things. You know, don't, don't say it in the words of other people. It's your own voice that's, that's important. And the kind of the long approach also is important to kind of going back to your experiences, going back to your initial application and going back to thinking about if I was asked about certain things in an interview situation, what else do I have in my kind of bank of experience that I can bring forth to bear on that interview situation? What other types of examples can I use to demonstrate those things? You know, I don't want to, I don't want to repeat the stuff that's on my application form. I've got loads. I want to look like I'm the kind of person who's got so much that I can draw on. Yeah, and, and again, that makes you that kind of interesting person that we're all kind of seeking um, to find. And also, again, it's that level of comfort about... You know, when you're nervous in an interview situation, if you know your material really, really well, um, you know, th there's an element of sort of calm that you can bring to bear on a situation where if you have that bank in your head of stuff, I know this is the stuff that I can talk about. I'm really familiar with this. You know, I've known about this and I've gone over it many, many times. I'm, you know, when I'm nervous, I know that I can rely on that information to come out in a sensible, ordered, structured, you know, well-reasoned way. There's a balance, don't over-rehearse stuff, because again, it's the genuine thing that we're looking for, not something that's necessarily too over-rehearsed, but you know, just generally kind of slowly get to grips and get familiar with all of these kind of the commercial stuff, the stuff in your own experience, and then you're able just to talk much more kind of knowledgeably and naturally about, about that stuff in an interview situation. And the interview should take on the guise of being more conversational, mm. so not partner sitting there with his 20 questions and we're not leaving this room till we've got through this 20 questions, because that's all very wooden and very, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for, artificial. Whereas actually what you want to do is reach common ground and then have a conversation around it. And if you really know your stuff and you have your bank of knowledge and you've taken the, the, the long game way of, of, of getting to that interview, it is going to become a lot more two-way. It'll be much more around the conversation rather than the partners or your interviewers thinking, well, we didn't really go anywhere with that question. We've come to a dead end. Now I better ask another one. And that just becomes a very, very stilted um, time period of time and that's you know if you are suddenly back out the door after 15 minutes chances are you've just not opened up and and you haven't given anything that the partners then think wow actually this could be a really nice interview and and you know it, it's a bit of an oxymoron but you want partners coming out of those interviews saying I really enjoyed that these are busy people and you have to be a little bit forgiving as well because they will bring the blackberries into the interviews they will clearly sit there not having read your application forms and it's all kind of very new to them and it's because they're busy and they don't have time they've had to prioritize and all that good stuff but actually you can actually make it easier for them and if you end up having a really good conversation because you've really done your research and you know your stuff and you're relying on your bank of knowledge and competencies and all the rest of it it's actually going to turn out to be really enjoyable and that partner is or interviewing panel is going to come away and think they'd be really good and that the clients would like them that's the bottom line how much of the partner interview then is down to personality and how well you fit into the firm. 
It's a huge uh, amount. And, and a lot of people, again, get a bit carried away where they think, oh, we've, we've reached common ground early on. So whether it's, you know, you went to the same school or, you know, you support the same football team or whatever, that's not your green light to then just relax, throw yourself back and say, oh, well, we've got so much in common. Um, it, it's really about you kind of keeping up the, the show, if you like, for the whole of the interview. Um, so I, I don't know if any of you yeah, want to kind I mean, of... They, these, these are highly yeah. intelligent individuals who, as Caroline said, are busy, but they focus on graduate recruitment because it is the future <coughs> of their business. And I, I agree with you. I, I love it when I see partners come out of interviews or I'm interviewing with a partner. I can see they're getting so you know, excited about the prospect of what this pers person's going to be like in a few years' time. And that's what you want. You want them to, because it's a huge investment they're putting into you as an individual, and you're not going to make money back for their business for quite some time, actually. So they are looking for, to build that potential up. Um, you are going to be challenged. They're going to play devil's advocate. <coughs> they're going to disagree with you. Again, as long as you know that when you go into those interviews, and expect that. Um, it's not because they want to be horrible to you. It's because that's what happens with their clients day in, day out. And um, they probably like the fact that they can, they can be disagreeing with you on things as well. See, and, and when you get a really fantastic candidate, seeing how far you can push them is a really fantastic thing to have. Um, I've lost count of the amount of times I've heard partners come out of interviews saying, we had a really interesting um, you know, exchange of views. I didn't really agree with that person was saying, but I loved the way they argued it. And you're going into a profession where you're going to need to argue in a constructive way and analyse and, and see both sides, several sides of the, of the story, of the situation. And that's one way of showing you. You're going to have a I would expect you to have a debate about something in an interview. And, and don't sit there thinking, oh, I haven't prepared for that. Go with the flow. It's as, as you said, Sarah, knowing you're having your bank of information in the back of your head. And it's not about over-rehearsing and over-prepping. It's just thinking, if I'm asked about this, I'm going to have a view on it. And that's, what, that's actually all we can ask of you yeah. in an interview. Because you don't know how to be a lawyer yet. We'll train you and we'll teach you all of that. But you need to have the skills to have that conversation and have an intelligent discussion about something. And it's also the skill of recovery. Yes. You yeah. know, these, people, these partners are, are putting you in uncomfortable situations. They want to see how you're going to come back. Are you going to hold your ground? Are you going to buckle and say, oh, you're a partner, you clearly must be right, therefore my view is wrong. We, they don't want to see that. But equally, if you get to those situations, we've all been there, and I'm sure you all have, where you suddenly think, I should have brought my spade into this room because I am now digging a <laughs> hole, and I'm just going to jump into it at the first available opportunity. It's your recovery that will actually get you through the interview and some of the best interviews have been where candidates have actually made it easier for us because you've given us the opportunity to then start probing and all the rest of it so we haven't had to set, set again artificial scenarios you've actually given us the material and we're just seeing well are you going to jump into that hole or are you going to come back out and you're going to recover and quite often when you come out and you think that was dreadful because I got it all wrong and I was jumping into this hole quite often that was probably your best interview they want to see that. They want to see that grittiness in you. And that comes back to my point earlier and what we were saying earlier. You've got to be ready to put yourself through that. And if you're not, then give it a year. Apply next year. You'll be a totally different person. You can help yourself by, um, if you've got access to a career service at the moment or at the time when you've got an interview coming up, you can go for some assistance in terms of preparing you for a particular interview um, with your careers advisor. Um, this is the sort of work that I do quite a lot. In fact, I know there's somebody in this room that I did this process with um, within the last couple of weeks. Um, so they can, by having a dummy run at the interview, you may not get precisely the questions that you're going to get, but at least you'll, you'll feel what it's like to be answering these questions. You'll feel where you're getting nervous, uh, where you're tying your tongue up in knots and are unable to articulate yourself and the advisor should be able to run through some techniques with you as to how you can manage your nerves, um, take things more slowly perhaps. There's a variety of techniques that you can learn about that should help you in the interview room. We're going to have to move on. I think we're kind of running out of time. Uh, so just taking a kind of final look at the whole application process leading up to it and throughout it. Um, networking is obviously a really important aspect of that. But Sarah, how you know what what's acceptable in terms of keeping in touch with recruiters throughout that process? Should they add you? Should candidates add you on LinkedIn? Should they uh, email you out of hours and stuff like that? Is it is it okay? Um, I mean, there's uh, probably firms might differ slightly on 
on their kind of view on this. For me personally, I probably won't add you on LinkedIn. It depends the scenario in which, you know, the recruiter that you're dealing with is, is kind of working in. Um, I work on my own. I don't have a team. So, um, you know, I also do another role for the firm as well. And I, I just, I, there's no, with the best will in the world and, you know, not, not wanting to be rude or anything, I'm just never going to be able to keep in that level of contact with individual applicants. Um, you've got to kind of be aware that you've got to, you know, apportion your time in a, in a reasonable kind of fashion. Um, also, from the perspective of, you know, respecting the process and respecting the recruiters that you're going to be coming into contact with, you know, um, you know, I get probably 10 to 12 different kinds of um, questions per day on things to do with, you know, recruitment issues or whatever, um, you know, and at, 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 you know, times closer to, you know, deadlines, that, that goes up. Um, you know, that your kind of query may not be the only query that I have, you know, that I'm dealing with. So it's just about recognising kind of what scenario the recruiter who you're corresponding with um, may be in and just bearing in mind that um, you know they're going to be dealing with a lot of uh, of people and they've just got to kind of apportion their time in as reasonable a way as as they can so um, you know Carol I mentioned earlier about kind of over familiarity there's sometimes a little bit of that comes into some of the email communication that I've had sometimes with people. Be careful um, about that. You know, don't necessarily think because I might have met you at an event that I'm now your best friend. Um, sometimes I get emails from people who kind of phrase their queries in such a way that it feels like I'm just kind of down the pub with them. Um, you know, you're still entering a professional kind of environment. We're still going to be looking at your your questions to us on an email and thinking to ourselves, well, they've spelt six words in this three-line email incorrectly. Um, you know, so be aware any kind of communication that you have during that process with the firm maintains a professional air about it. Stand away from the smiley faces. Yeah. Mm. Get a lot of those. And kisses. Lovely. But not really, <laughs> you know. Not... Yeah. Round off with a couple of questions from the audience. Then, does anyone have any questions about the whole application process? Comprehensive, folks. You've answered everything. There we nope. go. Maybe not. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, um, with regards to the application process, um, in choosing your um, trainees, do you? Is it, ma is it mainly dependent on, for example, the partner interview, or does it highly depend on that interview, or is it more to do with the exercises that they go through? So which one is more important, or are they all equally important? Good question. For us, it's, it's the whole piece, um, and uh, our partners respect that, and, and they, they looked at, we, we sort of moderate decisions um, centrally um, with my team and the partner responsible for recruitment. So we see the, the overall quality of all the candidates coming through. So there's no point us wasting our time and our fee earners' time running all these other assessments if we're not going to bring them into the mix. Um, you, I mean, some candidates may not excel across the board, but as I said earlier on, we're looking for potential. Um, but it, I think it's unusual. If you, fail, if you didn't do very well in two, two out of three, you're probably not going to get an offer. Um, but for us, so we're looking ideally for that consistency um, with a view that maybe one out of the three is, is a little bit weaker than the other two. So it's, it's quite difficult to say definitively, but there'd be no point us wasting time putting together all these exercises if we weren't going to use them. And just the same, say the first assessment, you think, oh, I really bombed on that and I, didn't, I don't think I've done very well. Don't give up. Mm. That's where you can turn it around yes. with the, the rest of the day. Um, because, you know, very rarely will somebody can, you know, get that kind of 90% across the whole, the whole piece. Um, it is about that kind of that mix as, as well. So, you know, kind of pick, pick yourself up, dust yourself down and just be even hungry for it when you get to the next stage. Because that's resilient. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Any more questions? It was that chap there who did put up his hand. Sure. Yeah, just before. Yeah. So, yeah, chap with the full time. Yeah, thanks. Um, so say you got through uh, to the assessment day or even the partner interview, but you didn't make it, you didn't get the training contract or vacation scheme. Are you then 
any more likely, any less likely to, when you reapply, when you try again, are you any less likely to uh, get as far again because you've showed what you can do? I think this is where you've got to be very, very careful. Um, firms will differ. My take from, from the Clyde & Co side was if, is, if you've been through the assessment centre and you've got through to interview and you've been through the whole thing and it's a no, see what the feedback is. And that's where we'll be candid with you. And if we're going to say, look, we really don't think you're right for us, there's nothing really that's going to suggest you're going to be right for us next year. So then I think draw a line under it. And, and we will try and get that through in our feedback to you. Quite often we will say to people, actually, we, don't, we think you need to build on this or this is how we need to, we maybe want to wait for another set of results or whatever it'll be. Really listen to the feedback you're being given and let that become your steer. If you have been rejected and you've had quite constructive feedback, and again, this is where firms are going to be very, very careful as well, because, and I think Caroline said it earlier, this isn't an exercise for us to be crushing you, because it might just be that you weren't right for us, but it doesn't mean to say that you're not going to be right for another four or five firms and going to end up with three or four training contract offers at the end of it. So we've got to be very candid, um, but yet very careful in our feedback. And a lot of it is just, that for whatever reason, we just didn't think you were a right fit for our environment for the firm for the client base whatever it may be but I think you've just got to take that feedback on board and if I can just say as well in terms of giving feedback and I know Sarah you said that you give feedback on the day as human beings we're very reactive and we don't take bad news well we want answers we almost want that public inquiry it's a bit like you said you've made a mistake and that, that's just a human reaction. If you are seeking feedback on the back of bad news, you're not thinking rationally and you're not going to accept it or listen to the actual feedback that's been given to you or, or want to take it in a constructive way. So we as policy will not give anybody feedback for at least a week after we've delivered you the bad news because you need to think about it. And with a little bit of time as well and a little bit of reflection, you might actually think, you know what, in my heart of hearts, I knew I hadn't done that well. And then that's when actually you're going to accept the feedback and actually be able to use it then in terms of your plan for the next year. Have we run out of time? Yeah, sorry. Well, if you join me in thanking the panel then, thank you very much for your time. Right, well, yeah, thank you very much, panellists, for all your wise words and sound advice, as ever. Um, hearing it straight from those who have the power to welcome would-be lawyers to the profession with open arms or refuse entry, as the case may be, uh, carries a lot of weight, so thanks. Um, and a final big thank you to all the trainees, associates, partners, and other firm representatives who presented the workshops and took part in the panel discussions as well as all of our sponsor firms and the University of Law for your continued wide-ranging support and involvement with City Law Live. We uh, quite literally couldn't have done it without you. Um, importantly, thanks to you all for attending today. I hope City Law Live has exceeded your expectations and that you can take away some useful tips. Uh, final note, please hand over your completed feedback forms and badges as you leave the theatre. We wish you all the best of luck with your future legal careers and thanks again for coming. <laughs>